From the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let's go ahead and uh, begin this morning with a word of prayer. Well, gracious Heavenly Father, uh, how awesome it was this morning, Lord, to uh, to watch the sun come up and just to spread its rays across your creation, just reminding us of, uh, of how it is that you take care of, 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 of this creation that, that you have placed us in here in this place. Uh, Lord, uh, as we look at your awesomeness, uh, we just give thanks that what you have done is you have, you have given us your word to, uh, to help prepare us, to know your character, to know your will, to, uh, to understand a little bit more each day as to how you would like us to live our lives and conduct ourselves actually too in the life of the church. So we ask Lord as we've gathered here once again for study of your word that uh, what you would do is uh, not just enlighten our minds but uh, but Lord just uh, uh, just fill our hearts with uh, uh, with your word and your direction. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. All right so I don't know exactly where we left off. I have to always look to Alvin because he always tells me. So, so, so where, where are we at? We started on... We're going to read chapter 17. Okay, we're going to read 17... 16 through 21. 16 through 21. Okay. This is in Acts, right? In Acts. Um, just a word of thought, because remember, it would have been a few weeks ago now. Um, that I asked you to start thinking about what you wanted to study when we got done with Acts. And uh, I know a lot of people wanted to go through the book of Revelation. I said that is a very involved book. But one of the things I thought was, uh, we can start maybe doing a study on the seven letters to the seven churches, which is at the beginning of the book of Revelation. So what we'll, what we'll do is when, Act, when we finish Acts, whatever, <laughs> um, then why don't we do that? Is that okay with everybody, or do you have something else in mind that you guys wanted to study? Sounds good. Sounds good? All right, good deal. <clears throat> uh, all right, so so as we continue here in uh, Acts chapter 17, we know Paul is still on his, uh, on his second missionary journey. Um, and so from what I understand is Paul has not made his way to Athens yet. Uh, so that's the section that we're, we're going to get into. Um, we know that he ran into difficulty, right? He ran into difficulty. Uh, he's kind of in trouble for stirring up crowds and things like that. And so then he had to, they had to slip away, didn't they? Um, so let's go ahead and read... Um, uh, verses 16 through 21. 16 through 21. Somebody read that for us. I found a few study guides of chapter 17, if anybody needs one. Okay, 17 or 18? Chapter 17 you're doing, right? Right, 17 verses 16 through 21. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Heropagus, where they said to him, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Okay. So, one of the things that uh, we know is Athens was, uh, 
you know, a center of sophistication for the Greeks and was filled with many memories of the great philosophers. So Athens was one of those places to be if you were a philosopher. But Paul saw, Paul saw in this place, he saw many who were devoted to idolatry. Now, we talk about culture shock, um, because the society Paul has encountered, uh, or he's entered into while he waits for Silas and Timothy, is very different from what it is he's used to. Okay, what is he used to? He's used to going to the synagogue and hearing what? You know, the teachers, Pharisees and whatnot. All right, and so here he comes and he encounters all of these Greek philosophers. And they are well known to the people of Athens. Um, and so, and, and just to sort of think about how big a deal this is, if you remember Corinth, Corinth was a city of great importance, wasn't it? All right, again, mostly because of where it was located. But what's happened is Athens now is, is rivaled in, if not even, even bigger in importance than Corinth. But the problem is, this is a city uh, that was entrenched in Greek mythology. Okay, it's got Greek mythology. Their architecture is is Greek, but these were the things that made it great in the eyes in the eyes of the people. Okay, so so I want us to note a couple of things here. Okay, the first thing is we as we read about what Paul does here is he was in no way humbled by the pride of the people in Athens. But he was actually set on edge, if not put over the edge, uh, because of their flagrant idolatry. Okay? And so he was motivated to put forth the glory of God where this idolatry was so pervasive in the life, in the life of the people. Okay? And the other thing is, is that Paul uh, was, was, uh, impressed by this show of dedication they had to all of these philosophies um, that they were teaching. So, if you're trying to think like Paul, which is tough to do, I'm just going to tell you. And you think about Paul's method of operation here. He went to the synagogue um, to talk to the Jews, and then he went where? To the marketplace to talk to the people there. Now we got to understand the marketplace just so it wasn't like, you know, like a farmer's market or something like that. All right? It, 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 was, it was really a different kind of place. It was a place where people went to meet. It was a place where they went to converse. It's a, you know, you know where we had all these philosophers would all be gathering. And so when Paul comes in and you got all these philosophers talking about their, I don't know, philosophy, I guess. Um, you know, what happens? He's got a ready crowd, doesn't he? He's got a ready crowd of people in order to talk to. And, and of course, these people, as you talk about philosophies, their minds are very open to hearing, you know, hey, what is this philosophy? Explain yourself. So he's got this audience that's well-versed in in seeking out new philosophy, uh, of, he's got this group of people who's now ready to listen to him speak. And, and to not only just listen to him, but to actually engage him in a very serious discussion. Okay, this is Paul's mode here, okay? And so then what we find is, of course, the interest arises there in the marketplace, doesn't it? I mean, he's drawing, he's drawing a crowd. <laughs> All right, and it wasn't long before he probably, you know, caught the attention of some pretty influential people. Um, now, he gives us two. Um, Luke gives us two schools of thought for these philosophers: the Epicureans and the Stoics. Now, I sort of look at those as kind of two groups of people that spent a lot of time um, 
discussing. That's what I'll say. Uh, you know, discussing. You know, their different philosophies of with with one another. And you got to understand that that's really basically how these guys made their living. So no doubt these discussions they would have would go on day after day. And, and you can imagine, you know, if you're engaged in a discussion, you know, with, with people day after day after day, a lot of times the topics you're discussing and those kind of things, they tend to be the same. Maybe you get a little different flavor in the discussion, but they tend to be the same kind of discussion. And then what happens? In walks this forwarder. In walks this forwarder. Steps in, steps into this, in, into this discussion. Okay? And what he had to say to them was foreign, wasn't it? It was foreign. It was foreign to them. It was not along the lines of the way that they used to have their discussions day in and day out. Now, um, you know, one of the things, um, you know, I, I remember from, from when I, I was uh, a while ago, uh, used to negotiate contracts uh, with, uh, with the government there in Washington, D.C. One of the things that I would always do is I would always try to get to know the styles and the mannerisms of the people that I was negotiating with. All right, and that was very important because what that related to me was how it was they were going to react when I brought when I brought certain things up. In other words, I would then know what buttons to push and what buttons not to push. Okay, um, and so here you got Paul coming in, and he throws something completely out of left field, uh, you know, into the mix here, um, and so when backed into a corner, all right, sometimes the best uh, defense is what? A good offense, right? A little plug for football today, you know, I probably won't watch. <laughs> yeah, I still haven't packed to leave yet. I, I mean, I still have a few hours before I have to go. So, um, so, so, so anyhow, so, so, so they're trying to, to get this handle on what Paul is trying to tell them, and, and you know, and so, some of those who oppose Paul, what do they say? They say, well, what is this babbler talking about? You know, he's, he's advocating these new gods. But was he really advocating a new god? No. He's new to them, but he was not advocating a new god. He was, uh, he was advocating the god, okay? And what he was introducing to them was, was something they didn't know, and that was the gospel message. Okay, introducing the gospel message. And so you got to figure, you know, Paul steps into this, into this group of people that have been meeting together day in, day out for probably a very long time, and he brings in this new gospel. You got to think Paul's kind of treading on thin ice here, don't you think? You know? I'm going to come in here and I'm going to tell you, yeah, you guys talk about there, but let me, let me tell you about, about this God. All right? And so in their mind, as she's trying to bring up this, in their mind, new God, in their mind, what he's doing is he's bringing up an illicit religion. Okay, this is like, whoa, don't be doing this. So what do they do? They took him to the Areopagus, right? They took him down to the Areopagus, that the High Council of Athens, right, where they asked him to explain what it was he was teaching in that place. Now, these men were just like those that he was debating with there in the marketplace. Um, now, the interesting thing I find here, and maybe I shouldn't find it interesting, is... They wanted to hear what he had to say. They wanted to hear what he had to say. They weren't angry at him. They wanted to hear what he had to say. Um, and, uh, and, and then they would then make that determination as to whether or not um, this was a good teaching or not. And so that's what we see happen, happening here. 
You know, they want to hear this new thing that Paul has to tell them. Okay? All right, so let's read um, 22 through 28. Let's go ahead and read that. As Paul addresses the Areopagus. Somebody want to pick that up? Verse 22 through 28. The crowd joined in at, in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these <coughs> orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, so, there was a no, no, verse Acts 17, <coughs> verses 22 through. Sorry. Well, that's all right, because I'm sitting there going, wait a minute. That's a different translation. <laughs> stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. As for I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you are worship. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I'm going to claim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth, and does not live by does not live in temples by human hands, and he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he called all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of our own poets have said, we are his offspring. Okay. All right, so what do we see happening here? Okay, so they want to hear about this new, this new thing Paul is talking about, this new what they thought was illicit religion, right? And what Paul wants to do is he wants to tell them uh, something about something that they do worship. Now, one of the things I want us to notice here is, is there's a real building drama here, isn't there? You see, you see the drama building? You know, he's talking with the, the folks in the marketplace. All right, now we gotta take this to a higher authority. And he takes they take it to a higher authority. And then Paul really steps out and he says, okay, I gotta, I gotta tell you about what it is you worship. All right? This is another one of those scenes that you, you know, you just sort of try to picture in, in your mind. Uh, so here you have in the midst uh, of all this Greek culture, in, in, in an audience of probably the most notable people there in Athens, there stands Paul. Okay, now again, I keep telling you guys I'm a very visual person. I've got this picture of Paul standing there, and all of these people gathered all around him, kind of looking, looking down at them. And, and I think Paul's address to them, at least in my mind, is again trying to understand the way Paul's mind work, Paul's mind works. I really think the way Paul addresses them is a masterpiece, if ever, if ever there was one, okay? Because what he did is he brought the, 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 whole, the, the whole audience to a climax of excitement, and he compliments them. I want to compliment you on your, on your devotion to these objects that you worship. And then you get to verse 23. Let me read verse 23 again. For I was walking along, I saw you many altars, and one of them had this inscription on it, to an unknown God. All right. You have been worshiping him without knowing him, who he is, and now I wish to tell you about him. All right. So here becomes the theme now of Paul's discussion among them. 
He wants to tell them about this unknown God that they worship and really did not know that they were worshiping him. He's going to tell them something that they did not know. All these philosophers in a room, and he's going to tell them something they didn't know. Uh, something they didn't know that was actually even part of their culture. And they still didn't know it. But it was something that they really needed to know. And so what Paul does here is he appeals to the facts so that they would see the importance and they would understand. He's not, he's not using scripture uh, to preach about the one true God. Now, the scriptures, as we know, as we have studied the scriptures, we know they contain all the theology that Paul is basing his argument on. But to use scripture to validate his message would be useless to those who don't have it. I mean, they have no idea what he's talking about if he was going to be using, if he was going to be uh, using scripture. So what he does is he talks to them about this, this God, all right, basically through their own culture, all right? Telling them about their own culture, and he presents God as the creator, as the creator of all, okay? This God who is absolute. And he puts a special stress on man's relationship to this God and outlines their dependence on him. Now, connect with this, his first fact is that God, God needs nothing of man's hands. God doesn't need anything that man can create. They can't create anything that he wants. And why not? He's God, right? He is the creator. This, is, this would have been a good time to tell my dirt joke, but uh, I've already told that one to you, so we won't go there. <laughs> All right, so he needs uh, nothing from man um, because God is the one who brings all things uh, into existence. Life, breath, you know, food, everything. He brings all things uh, into, uh, into creation. They all have one source, and that is, that is the one true God. So not only did God's hand create everything, but he's really kind of been silent in his uh, creation. Through his hands, what has happened? Okay, think about what's happened. Look around you, look at our world today. What do you see? Nations have risen up, right? We've seen nations rise up. We've seen nations develop. We've seen nations decline. All right? Everything, everything's created by God. And God's desire is really got one focus, right? And God's desire is that all men know him to be an unknown God. You know, that's what he's trying to tell them. All men should know him, this unknown God, okay? And so what Paul is trying to do here is establish God's duty with regard to all men, okay? Made the man, he made the nations, he arranged the world, he gave uh, his creation a supreme purpose. And what's that purpose? And that is for all to seek him, right? To all to seek him and to, and to worship him. My brother-in-law has a, a bumper sticker that every time he gets a new car, he gets a new bumper sticker. But the bumper sticker says, wise men still seek him. All right? Wise men still, still seek him. All right? Um, so what implications does that have for us? What implications does that have for us? You know, he's trying to tell them, you know, what they need to do is to seek the one true God. Okay, so, so that either says that if they did know who the one true God was, they've lost him, they've walked away from him, or, or what? They may have never <coughs> known him, and they need, and they need to know him. 
So how does that then play into idol worship? Are idols important anymore? <coughs> yeah. No, they're not. They're not. Okay? Luther says what you worship is your God. You're going to worship sticks and stones. Well, guess what? Sticks and stones are your God. Um, and so this sets up really what I would almost call an embarrassing situation. Um, because here you've got all these well-known philosophers, and the question has to be, well, why didn't they know their creator? Right? Why didn't they know the one who rules over the entire creation? Why did they not know the one who provides for all of our needs of body and soul? And so the point Paul is driving home here is, why are you not cognizant of God? For without God, you cannot even live for a moment. Couldn't move a hand or a foot or, or anything like that. Nothing could exist. Wow. Wow. That's kind of in your face, don't you think? I, I would think so. You know, be told that. And here, these are the most learned people in the, in the land. All right? So that sets us up for 29 through um, the end of the chapter. All right? So let's go ahead and read that. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with judge justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysus, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. Okay. Hey. <coughs> right. so, so Paul says, I made my argument. <coughs> so now, he's trying to tell them what? He concludes that God's own offspring ought to know that his image could not be created by man. In other words, it could not be an idol, right? So man's skillful use of the resources God had given him could not be molded and shaped into the image of God. Okay? Do we know of another place where somebody tried to... Uh, Created an image that they would worship? Golden calf. Golden calf, right? <coughs> Golden calf. Alright, so not only not only that, but all that man has to offer could not provide even a good picture of God. I mean, if I were to ask you to uh, to describe God's divine nature, I think we'd all struggle with that, wouldn't we? I mean, I think we will. And so Paul is trying to, 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 to relate to them what they, uh, you know, that they have to understand that, that the one true God has to replace all of these idols, all of these idols that you have. All right? He's the one who created the heavens. He's the one who created the earth. He's the one who created man. He's the one who has created man's offspring. And what he's preaching to them is that this God is here, up here, and doesn't even come close to these philosophies of Greece, which are down here, okay? That God is so much, so much greater. Um, and so uh, the next point, the next point that uh, I wanted to make was God has evolved his judgment but has not excused disobedience. Now, we've seen as we've gone through the pages of Scripture, and we see this a lot sometimes in our readings, that, that, that God tends to overlook these flagrant 
displays of disobedience, does it? <laughs> You know, when somebody sins, God doesn't go, okay, you sin, zap, you're done, right? He doesn't do that, all right? Um, but his judgment, we can see, has really uh, evolved. Paul tells them there is one God, there is one human race, there is one way to salvation. And consequently, there will be one judgment. Now, the one thing Paul did not tell them was that their um, idolatrous situation had not met the purpose, the purpose uh, of God that men should seek him. All right? Because again, you know, if God said, okay, you don't seek me, okay, we zap you too. Okay? Um, but... But the fact that they did not <laughs> worship him, that they did not know him, all right, was evidence of their failure of faith. So what does God do? What does God do? This becomes important actually for us as well. Okay, what does God do? Who does he send? Ah, classic Sunday school answer. He sends Jesus, doesn't he? You know, he sends Jesus, and, and he puts that plan of salvation in the motion for the coming uh, for the coming ages. And what does Christ do? He takes all of those idolatries and those false gods, those false gods that people worship, when they turn to him and believe in him, all right, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, he is, the, he is the way to heaven. When, you know that when they believe in that, what he does is he takes all of those idolatries and all of those things away as he molds and shapes and changes hearts. All right? Now, did Paul mention Christ? No. No. But he will. <laughs> he will. He will here in a moment. So he's trying to tell them there will come a day of judgment. Now, the reason that God is now ordering these men to, to repent is the fact that, does anybody know what that day of judgment is going to be? No. Right? But he is a righteous God, and he will judge, he will judge in righteousness. And so what Paul is doing is he's, he's working on their consciences. He's trying to get them to think about what is it, what is it Paul is saying? What does this really mean, not just to who we are as a people, but what does this mean to me specifically? And what that means is, this God, this God is going to judge in righteousness. And how are they going to be able to stand before this God in judgment? All right? So Paul you know, brings Christ really uh, into the message here. He's going to execute judgment through a person that he has raised from the dead. He died for us. He rose again for our justification. And God is going to judge in the person of this one man. But again, note, Paul hasn't told them who it is. All right? And there's a reason for this. I mean, have you ever been trying to, you know, ask questions, trying to get to a specific answer but you just don't get there. Your interest is like, come on, this is what I really want to know. Come on, tell me, tell me. So what he's done is he has really piqued their interest. They want to know more. However, they're not going to hear more because what does Paul do? He leaves. It's basically, this is, this is like the epitome of a mic drop, okay? He tells them, you know, about, you know, this judgment that is coming and this person that's going to that's gonna judge everybody. And then he's like, okay, see you later. Bye. All right. Because Paul thinks he's explaining something to them they should have already known. But we know when God's word is proclaimed, sometimes it's not done in the fullness we would expect. <laughs> But when God's word is proclaimed, it does not come back empty. Right? It does not come back empty. 
And so what we can only call a, a glorious result happens. People are drawn closer. They're drawn closer to Paul and they believe. Now, Luke tells us that one Dionysius, um, who was one of the members of the Areopagus, was a believer. And given his standing in society, would lead us to believe that he's a leader among men, and he may even be one of the elders there uh, amongst the group. Now, um, I tried to figure out who this um, Tamaris is. Uh, and the only thing I could find out is this, um, uh, well, really, that there's really no information that I could that I could find. Um, but that you know, you see that the basic result is that um, many people came to believe. Now, many people. Notice I didn't say many men. So people would include women as well. Yes, I was thinking that yeah. that's why she was mentioned. Yeah. So many men and women would come to believe. Okay, important, very important. Because what was the society of the day focused on? Men, women were considered basically property. But what is important to Paul? Everybody can come to faith in the one true God. Okay? Very important message. All right? And so, and so here's the thing that makes it important for us, which I try to put here in the takeaway, that God continues to use his servants to share the gospel with others. And, and, and the thing that we see is we see this, this dichotomy that goes on. We've got this cultural gap that takes place, uh, you know, where, you know, I mean, I look at, at here where I try to, I felt, I felt really bad the other day. I have to tell you this. I felt really bad. Um, I had a problem at my apartment. I have lots of problems at my apartment. And so, so anyhow, the maintenance guy is out there. So I'm telling him, I'm just, I'm saying, here, I got a problem with this, I got a problem with that. I don't know why this is this is going on. You know, I've had a problem with the light that they've come out to fix, I don't know, probably a dozen times, and it's still not fixed. I'm going off and off. And then the guy's just smiling at me, listening to me. And then I look at him, he goes, no hablo inglés. <laughs> <laughs> oh, buenos dias. <laughs> so I was like, okay. But you see, we even have a culture here. Um, I, you know, I've, uh, and, and I, you know, I was hoping uh, Pastor Slack would be here because um, I knew uh, a guy who was starting a Hispanic ministry up in Sterling, Colorado, uh, Armenio. Um, and one of the things he told me is that as he tries to minister to the Hispanic community, um, that they worship a lot different than we do. All right? And so, you know, his deal was making this connection. Why? Because a lot of the Hispanic community is what? Roman Catholic. All right? And so they, 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 they look at things a little bit differently. Okay? And so that's the environment that God places us in. I mean, you can see the difference in that, but really everywhere you go, you've got something like that going on, right? You've got this, this difference in the culture, all right? This difference in the culture and then how you get that message to them. Just remember, God's word does not come back empty, all right? All right, that you, know, you let his word through the power of the Holy Spirit do what his word does. Which is my lead-in for my sermon. Funny how I got that in, huh? I wasn't sure I was going to be able to, but I did. Okay? So how much time? Oh, yeah, we got time. So do you have uh, uh, chapter 18? Okay, 
So Paul, you know, does his mic drop at the end of chapter 17. And so here at the beginning of 18, we're going to see Paul. He's going to be heading off to Corinth. Um, and the throes of his ministry, now you get a sense from the reading, is really starting to take its toll on him. Right? Um, and, and I think what we'll see is there's somewhat of a kink in his armor as he continues doing what he's always done. But as he's doing it, he's meeting this resistance uh, from the Jews. Um, and, he's so, and, he's, and he's suffering here something I think people today can, can really identify with. He's suffering a little bit of discouragement. Mm -hmm. And he's suffering a little bit of despair. Now, I'm going to tell you, <laughs> and, and, and President Maxwell kind of brought this up last week. Paul isn't the first man of God to ever suffer discouragement, let me tell you. Okay? There have been so many, so many, if you go through the scriptures, you know, because, um, well, take a look at a few. Okay? Moses had to put up with what? A whole lot of grumbling going on. Whiners, okay. I wasn't going to say that, but okay, you brought it up. Whiners. A bunch of whiners. A bunch of whiners, okay. Moses, uh, you know, he had all this, all these whiners. Uh, Joshua, after the uh, defeat of, of Ai, he got discouraged in the battle. Elijah, he, well, he, Elijah was on a roller coaster himself, wasn't he? He was experiencing these great, these great successes over, over the gods of Baal on Mount Carmel, only to have to do what? Flee into the wilderness in fear of Jezebel. I mean, you can go through Scripture and you can see where, where all these people that God has called into service, they had high points and they had low points, right? They had low points in their ministry. And so as we open chapter 18, Paul finds himself at one of these low points. You know, his second missionary journey has really, has really been grueling. Now, What's happened to Paul on this journey? What kind of things can you think of? Well, first off, he, he had what? The opposition of the Jews, didn't he? Mm -hmm. You know? He had um, uh, he had hecklers in the crowd, right? People, people crying out in the crowd. He had what? He had he had beatings. Remember the beating he took when he freed the demon-possessed girl there in Philippi? So he had that going on too. Um, he had uh, the experience of the earthquake too. Oh. In prison. Yeah, in prison. Um, he's been forced to leave towns because of what it was he was proclaiming. You know, he had success in Thessalonica, then he was forced to, to flee to Berea and you know, but he had great success, didn't he? Despite all these things that were happening to him, he had great success. And then in Athens, we just read, I mean, he had this stunning speech about this unknown God. And I, and I, 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 I love that speech. <laughs> this unknown God uh, that was pretty much ignored, wasn't it? <clears throat> okay. And so then what happens is Paul then heads to Corinth. All right. Um, Corinth was a major link between northern and southern Greece. So ships, what ships were done is they pulled the ships out of the water and they put them on rollers. Okay. Uh, so so they pulled them out of the water. They set up these rollers and they pulled them these four miles uh, across the land to get the water again. Rather than having them sail this, uh, I think they figure it's like 200 miles to get there if you went there by, by sea to go around the southern tip. Um, and I think uh, some of the historical documents show that even Emperor Nero, what he, uh, Nero, what he did is he started building a canal to try to, to try to connect, to try to connect the two. So as we find in many port cities, Corinth has a whole lot of Again, being a port city has a whole lot of sailors, right? Has a whole lot of, of, of sailors. Um, 
and they come from all different areas. You got people from all different cultures. You got business people, you got arts people, you got people that are really steeped in politics. All that you would expect in any cosmopolitan city. So, but you hear that name of that city, Corinth, and what do you think of? Corruption. Corruption? Immorality. Immorality. All right. Some pretty unpleasant, uh, you know, um, undertones there. You know, to um, there used to be a term they used, Corinthianize. Okay, Corinthianize, and it meant something akin to uh, prostitution in our language. Okay, so that's that immorality you were talking about, Don. Uh, prostitution in their temples, mobs of people coming in uh, to town. It's just a city that was kind of wild, uh, you know, sort of like um, what, what's that, Las Vegas? I was thinking, I was thinking New Orleans on Mardi Gras night. <laughs> okay, that's kind of what I was thinking. Uh, that's kind of the way. That's kind of the way. That's the picture I get in in, in, in my in my mind. They all they all went their own way. Okay, so let's uh, let's read the first seventeen verses of chapter eighteen of Paul in Corinth. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila and a native of Pontius, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded that all the Jews to leave Rome, and they went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked for them, oh, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the work, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook off his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titus, Justice, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. <coughs> and many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking, and do not be silent, for... I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you. For I have many in this city who are my people. They And he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. Is that as far as I go? No, 17. Okay. Then Galileo was proconsul of Acacia. The Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, this man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was brought to was about to open his mouth, Galileo said to the Jews, "If it were a matter of wrongdoing of or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint." But since it is a matter of questions about the words and names and your own laws, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them <coughs> from the tribunal. And they all seized Sosius, the Sos ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Galileo paid no attention to this. Okay. So one of the things we find here is Paul does work for a living, doesn't he? Okay, um, Paul remained in Corinth, uh, you know, roughly about 18 months, and Luke thought it would be uh, appropriate to, uh, uh, to let people know that he supported himself and the importance of, uh, of the people he associated with uh, in, in, in Corinth, people like Aquila and, and Priscilla, 
um, the Emperor Claudia was in power, and he was very friendly towards the Jews. He let them, he gave them a whole lot of privileges. He let them pretty much do what they want. Um, and, and one of the reasons for that is when, uh, you know, all the, the Jews were expelled from Rome, uh, they started migrating towards towards Corinth. Um, so Aquila and Priscilla uh, were part of a group that were affected by that decree. So Paul lived with them his entire <laughs> stay in Corinth, and he worked with Aquila as both were tent makers. So it's an important to understand that Paul uh, had a trade. Now, every Jewish boy was taught a trade in order to help them be independent when they got older, when they got out on their own. We saw that, you know, like a lot of the, the you know, the apostles, they were what? Fishermen. Fishermen. They followed in the steps of their, of their father or something like that. And so what happens here is Paul returns to uh, full-time proclamation of the gospel. All right. So, um, you know, back in, you know, chapter 17 that we just talked about, um, over the couple of weeks here, um, we talked about this mission of Timothy and Silas, who were sent from Athens. They were sent to Thessalonica and to Philippi. And now what's happening is they are returning and joining back up with Paul in Corinth. And that's where Paul began to really hold himself to the Word. And so what that means, he began to devote all of his time to testifying to the Jews about Jesus being the Messiah. Now, the thing we find is, is in Corinth, the Jews are up to their same old tactics, aren't they? Right? They're up to their same old tactics. The Jews opposed Paul. They were abusive to him. So he had no other choice but to withdraw. Now, I think when we see how Paul withdrew, kind of shows his deep emotion. We've talked about shaking the dust off your shoes and leaving. Now, the act of shaking your garments is symbolic in the same way. Okay, shaking the dust uh, off your garments is the same as shaking the dust off your feet. There is a difference that, 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 you know, in, in doing that. When you shake the dust off, what do you say? Shake the dust off your feet, your shoes, and leave town, right? The difference is Paul was inside. Shake the dust off your garments. So you are not taking that with you when you leave. All right? Um, the dust would testify to judge, actually. Um, was shaking the dust off, was that going to basically judge the people? Is that going to judge the people? No. No. It's a, you know, the judgment is God. You're right. The judgment is God. But shaking that dust off tells them that, okay, you did not receive my message, and so I leave, I leave you having, having told you that message. You know, but here's another way of, 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 kind, of kind of looking at it. By shaking that dust off their garments, um, you know, basically, uh, he's telling them that these Jews are destroying themselves. And their blood is on their own hands. It's not on his. He's told them the message of the gospel. They have, they have rejected. They have rejected them. All right. So this is like Paul telling them, "I'm going to tell you guys this is the message of the gospel. You guys want to reject it. You are committing spiritual suicide. That's what's going on. Okay, spiritual suicide." Um, and so, uh, um, so, so anyhow, we see him leaving. He goes to the house of a, uh, of, of a potter and um, probably trying to put too much into a couple minutes here. Um, I'll tell you what, I want to come back to that. Uh, I'll tell Pastor Schleck, that's what we need to talk about.
when he starts up next week. Okay. All right. So we'll we'll go ahead and end there. I'll make a note. Of course, I didn't bring a pencil with me. How do you like that? I'll make a note. <laughs> Thoughts? Any thoughts so far? You know, I, I think one of the things we have to pull from this is, you know, being a proclaimer of the gospel is not easy. All right? It's not easy. People are going to reject it. And they do reject it. I guess a little commercial for my sermon coming up. A little teaser there. But that happens. People reject it, they walk away. But here's the point that I want to make. Again, God's word does not just fade away. It does not, it, it, you know, it, 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 it's not empty words. That it, it continues to impact the life of people. You know, the Holy Spirit continues to work in the lives of people as they hear that word. And that's why it's so important that as we live our lives and as we reflect Christ in our lives, that that word continues to go on. Might be very subtle. Might be very subtle. You know, driving somewhere with somebody who maybe doesn't go to church and, you know, you almost get into an accident and it's, oh, thank God we didn't get in an accident. It's a little word. But where are you putting the thanks in what God's doing in your life? I don't know how many of you have ever said, you know, I look back over my life and I shouldn't be alive. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why I'm still living. There's a reason. God has called each and every one of you to be proclaimers of his gospel as well. All right? Whether you, whether you believe it or not, because you carry God's word here. All right? And it, and it comes out here. All right? All right. Well, let's go ahead and rise and we'll close with the Lord's prayer. Let's, let's do that. <coughs> so we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is now. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For God is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. All right, see you in worship. Oh, honey,